Thank you for joining us this morning for this webinar on unique function blocks. Uh, the presentation itself is roughly about 20 minutes or so. And if, uh, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to put them in and we'll get to those at the end. Welcome to today's tutorial. Let's get started. Let's have a look at today's agenda. Today, we're talking about unique Seascape function blocks. First, we'll look at what makes these function blocks unique. Then we'll go through all of these blocks you see here, which are scale, limit, day of the month compare, bit set, bit clear, a number of file functions for removable media, label functions, jump functions, and finally the key press function. So what makes some of these Seascape ladder logic function blocks unique? Well, some of these are unique to Horner and you won't find them with any other manufacturer. Others, while they may be available in some ladder logic language sets, they are outside the list of the typical ladder logic functions that are familiar to most users. Some of the blocks solve unique issues, while others are just useful in general and we want to make sure that you don't overlook them. First, we'll start with the scale function block. The scale function block can be found in the instruction toolbox under advanced math. This function makes scaling analog inputs over to engineering units very easy. Typically, you have an input variable which is usually either your analog input signal directly coming into the AI register, or it's a version of that value that's been converted to a real number, and then is used in a floating point version of the scale function block. So you have your input variable, a minimum and maximum that you're expecting from your input variable, and then your output variable, which is what the scale block is going to write to along with the minimum and maximum that you want written on the output side. Now let's look at that in Seascape. Today we'll have demonstrations for all the function blocks that we are looking at. So I have some logic here that's utilizing the scale function block. Here we have a tank level that we're monitoring. Let's look at how we can set this scale function block up. First on the input side, I'm using this in integer mode. This is a variable that's directly mapped to my AI register where my analog input is wired to, and that value is changing between 0 at 4 milliamps and 32,000 at 20 milliamps. On the output side, we have our tank level in millimeters. Here, 0 is the minimum, and 10 meters corresponds to 10,000 millimeters on the output side. Here, we're scaling our analog input over to millimeters, but we may want this information in feet, for instance. So let's look at another scale block that would convert from our 4 to 20 milliamp signal over to feet. Here we'll use a floating point version of a scale block, but in order to use that, we need to convert our analog input value over to another variable that's in a real or floating point format. So it's still going to be 0 to 32,000, but the value is going to be in a floating point form. Now that's going to be the input of our scale block and our output is going to be from 0 feet, which is the minimum, to 32.8084 feet, which is equal to 10 meters. When we execute that, we're going to get feet as the value in floating point. Finally, let's look at what the milliamps might look like with any particular value in our analog input register. Again, I'll stay in the integer form. Again, my analog input variable is directly mapped here in from the AI. The input is 0 to 32,000, and the output will be in milliamps. Here, instead of making this 4 and 20 min and max, I've made this 400 and 2,000, which basically has a couple of implied decimal points. So when I display that on the screen, I can put a decimal point two spots from the right, and I can display on the screen what my milliamp reading should be if I put a multimeter in the system. Now let's look at an OCS that's running this demo. So here's my tank level, and I have my IO simulator connected here. So as I gradually increase my analog value, you can see the counts coming into my analog input register that's scaled between 0 and 32,000. And as that rises, you can see my tank level rising as well in both millimeters and feet. I'm also showing electrically what I should be seeing on my multimeter between 4 and 20 milliamps. Now let's look at our next unique function block, and that's the limit function. This is one we've covered before in our compare functions webinar, but it's an important one. The limit function can be found in the compare operations in the project toolbox. This function block is great for detecting normal conditions as well as alarm conditions on your machine. So how does this function work? 
It passes power whenever the input variable that you're comparing against is between a low and a high input value. So whenever the input variable is between the low and high, it's in its normal range and then it passes power flow. If you want to detect if you're outside that range, you could just swap your low and high inputs and now it'll pass power flow when you're outside that range. Let's look at that in Seascape. Here we have a limit function where we're monitoring differential air pressure around an air filter. If the pressure value is falling in an acceptable range, it means our air filters are working properly. However, if our air pressure falls outside of the expected range, we'll flag that as an alarm condition and we know something's wrong. So in the first rung here, I'm detecting if the air pressure is normal, which is between the low and high inputs. Here I swap the high and low settings and I'll pass power flow if the current pressure is outside those limits, triggering our alarm condition. Now let's look at that on the OCS. Here on this screen you can see that our current air pressure is at 0 0.0485 and our normal range is between 0 0.15 and 0 0.75. So that means we're inside the normal range and our normal light is on. Now for example if I raise that air pressure value to 0.8, now we're outside the limits and our alarm is triggered. Next let's look at the day of month compare function. These can be found in our time and date operations in the project toolbox. This function is useful from a scheduling standpoint, as you can pass power based on a certain day of the month. This function passes power whenever the current day matches a flag from a double integer register that has a flag for every day of the month. This function uses a bitmap double integer register that has 32 bits associated with it, and the bits 1 through 31 correlate to a different day of the month the 1st through the 31st, and the 32nd bit is ignored. The function block checks today's day of the month versus the bitmap pattern in that variable, and then if today is flagged, it will pass power flow. Let's look at that in Seascape. For the day of the month compare, you simply have this bitmapped double integer that is the only input for the day of the month. And if that bitmap matches the flag for today, it's going to pass power flow. Next we're going to talk about the bit set as well as the bit clear function blocks. These are functions that can be found in the bitwise operation section. These functions are great for independently setting or clearing a bit within a word or a double word without impacting the other states. One of those applications where this is useful and often easier to use a function block than the boolean equivalent is with the day of month compare that we just looked at. Let's look at that now in Seascape. Here again is our filter example where we want to schedule days of the month where we want to change the filter. Let's say the 14th and the 28th for example. To make that work, in the previous rung that I showed you that utilized the day of the month compare, we have a 32-bit double integer variable with a flag for every day of the month. And whatever flags are set, we're going to pass power flow and set a flag that says we need to change the filter. But the way in which we get those flags set in the first place is by using the bit set logic here. The first thing I'm doing is I'm setting my 32 bits. I've got two consecutive words with a total of 32 bits that I'm using correlating with the 31 days of the month. I'm initially setting all those to zero. Then I'm using two bit set functions, one for each of the two different days of the month that I want scheduled to change the filter. I have a variable that is set from the touch screen, which is the day of the month I want to change it the first time and the day of the month I want to change it the second time. So for example, it could be the 14th and the 28th. And then that will set the bits for our day of the month double integer flag variable. And then back here, under the compare logic, we will turn on our indicator that tells us today is the day that I changed the filter. Now, I'll show that on the OCS. So I have my dates set for the 14th and the 28th. This video is being recorded on the 7th, so therefore today is not one of the days I have scheduled that I want to change the filter, so my indicator is off. However, if I decide that I want to do it on the 7th instead, and I change that, then my indicator is now on because my day of the month compare is now true. Let's look at our next unique function. Next we'll talk about some removable media file functions. These removable media file functions are filed under the removable media section in Seascape. We covered this in detail in our previous webinars on removable media, 
The rename, copy, and delete function blocks are very handy for general file handling, especially when you want to copy files such as data login files or recipe files from your micro SD drive over to a USB drive or vice versa. They also allow you to utilize wildcards like file counters and the current time and date to ensure that your file names are unique and your directory names are unique. Let's look at those functions in Cscape. We'll start with rename. Here's a rename function block with one input and one output along with a status. So I'm going to rename a file called capture.bmp and when I execute this function block, I want to rename it as archive.bmp. I also have a status variable here that can tell me whether it's successful or not. Now if I pass PowerFlow, it basically means that I've succeeded. Then I have some other conditions that I can look out for in my status variable. And then if those occur, I can turn on an indicator telling me my rename function failed and I can take corrective action. Let's look at that on the OCS. Here I'm executing the function block that I just showed you. We'll rename capture.bmp to archive.bmp. I'm going to trigger that with the push button here on the screen. You can see that that has failed. So why did that happen? The main reason it failed is because you'll notice that the file wasn't on our micro SD drive to begin with, which is one way this process could fail. So let's go to the tank screen and let's do a screen capture of that. And then we'll have that file that we want to rename available on our memory card. Now, if I look in my removable media, capture.bmp is there. So now we should be able to rename that. I'll hold down the rename button and that has worked correctly. I'll go back into removable media and now we have a file called archive.bmp. Now let's look at copy. That's useful if you want to move a file from micro SD over to USB, for example. So this gives you the ability to grab a copy of a file directly from the OCS. With this function block, you have an input side or a source and a destination side. In our example, we'll copy that archive.bmp file from the micro SD card over to USB. I know it's USB because I've specified B colon backslash because the B drive is my USB drive. I'll also be putting it in a subdirectory called captures and then into another folder that is based on the month, day and year. And then the file that I'm copying isn't going to be called archive.bmp it'll be a file name based on the hour, minute and second I did the copy. Now let's go back to our OCS and let's go ahead and execute this. My USB drive that I've plugged in to the XL7 now has the copy of archive.bmp, but it's using the hour, minute and second file name within the folder that we specify. Now let's go back to Cscape and look at the last file type function, and that is the delete function. Here, all we need to do is identify what file we want to delete. We've copied archive.bmp away in our workflow, and now let's go and delete it. I'll show you that now on the OCS. So here is the delete screen. The file we want to delete is still there in our removable media. So I'll go back and I'll press my delete button, and then I'll go back into my removable media. And now you can see it's not there, so that's worked correctly. Let's look at our next function blocks, which is the label and more importantly, the jump function. These can be found under special operations in the toolbar. The label is great for program organization in general, especially for labeling a section of your code that you want to jump using a jump instruction. When you use a jump instruction along with a label instruction, usually you're jumping forward in the program, skipping over a section of logic. Jumps are also good for creating loops, but you have to be very careful that you don't create an infinite loop, as that can cause your program or your controller to reset continuously. Let's look at those functions in Cscape. Here I have logic that utilizes the label and the jump. Here we're saying that we have a barcode that we're reading in and included in those characters are characters that we can print and characters that aren't printable. For example, carriage returns, line feeds, etc. So what I want to do since I'm going to be printing this is strip out any characters that aren't printable. To do this, I like to utilize a loop. This will examine each character individually, one after the other inside the loop. And then I want to keep the characters that are printable 
and replace the ones that are not printable with a printable character. For this, I typically use a space character, which is decimal 32. You can tell if a character is printable or not by looking at its ASCII value. If the ASCII value of a character is below 32, it's not printable, and if it's 32 or above, it is printable. Here I have some logic where we're going to go ahead and execute the area between the label and the jump as a loop. When we decide we want to fix our barcode, this contact is going to turn on, and we're going to reset a character counter to zero. Here's the start of what my loop is going to be. The first thing I'll do is execute this indirect move command. What does this indirect move do? That's examining my current barcode string by extracting the character that corresponds to my current character count, which is currently zero, which is the very first character of the string, and then storing that first character in another variable called character to check, which is going to check if that character I just extracted is less than 32. If it is, it's not printable, and I want to replace that character with a space, which is printable. And then, using another indirect move going in the other direction, I'm going to restore that character back into the same string that I took it from in the first place. Then, I'm going to increment my character counter and see if it reached 20, which is the number of times I want to go through the loop. If I haven't, I'll execute my jump command and go back here to the label, and I'll do that all over again. I'll execute this a total of 20 times. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to fall out of the loop and reset the flag that put me in to start with. Let's take a look at that on the OCS. So here's a display of the barcode that I've taken in. Those boxes at the end are card return line feed characters that are not printable. So I want to strip those out. So when I press this button here, it should execute my loop and it should take out the card return line feed but leave everything else the same. And you can see that's worked correctly. Now let's look at the last function for today, and that is the key press function. It can be found in the toolbox under special operations. The key press function is useful for replicating the function of a specific user interface key, but instead of touching the screen or using an OCS key to execute that, instead you're going to use a dedicated physical push button that's wired to a digital input. Why would you want to do that? Well, one case is when there's no way for the user to touch the screen. For example, in a hazardous location where you have an OCS mounted. For example, like an explosion proof enclosure. That could have a clear thick window so you can see the screen, but you have no way of pressing the buttons. In that scenario, in order to give as much functionality as possible, you could replicate the up and down arrow and the escape and the enter key using this function block. So let's look at that in Seascape. The configuration is very straightforward. First, for each key press that you are going to be replicating, you need to assign a variable that is mapped to a hardwired digital input. So in my case, I have a variable for the up key called in underscore up underscore key. And if we look down here in my program variable list, and I'll scroll down and find that particular variable, the up key is mapped to percent %i1 because presumably there is a hardwired push button that is going to replicate the functionality of the up key. And you'll notice for the down, escape and enter, we also have hardwire inputs matched to those variables. One thing to note with the key press function is that it never passes power. So you can't have a string of these in series on the same rung as only the first one will execute. So therefore they all need to be on their own individual rung. Now let's look at that on the OCS. Here I have a menu object and we're replicating the up, down, escape and enter keys using push buttons and the key press function. I have an XL7 here with a menu object shown in the center and I've hardwired through my IO simulator four inputs which are going to be slide switches which will work fine here. Using that, let's see what we can do. First, I'll hit enter so I can get to my fuel selection. Next, I'll use the up arrow to change to a different fuel. I hit that twice to get to propane, and I'll hit enter to accept that. Now I'll hit the down arrow until I get to diagnostics, and then I'll hit enter again. So that's a straightforward way of replicating push buttons. Thank you for joining me for today's tutorial, and the Q&A session will begin shortly.
Okay, nice and straightforward that one. Um, I'm not seeing any questions as yet. So you should all hopefully see my screen now again. So next week we do have hands-on with CSCON protocol and then followed up with CSCAN with Smart Rail IO. Um, as usual, it'll be the same time every week, every Thursday. And again, if you've any past ones that you'd want to go back to, they're always there. And if there's anything we haven't shown, feel free to get in contact and we will put one together. Um, I'll just jump back in at the questions for one last look. Um, don't see anything coming in. Uh, okay, thank you for joining us this morning and uh, we hope to see you again next week.